innovation series on future of work with guests Gobi Dasu and Joyce Jean Gray. I'm co-president Alex Mutubini, MSO8. Our group's mission is to enrich, educate, and unite the Stanford startup community in innovation centers across the country beyond California. Launching in the pandemic, we offer monthly virtual programming to entrepreneurs and their supporters. The format today will start with an introduction of our guest, followed by their analysis of the latest research from Stanford professor Nick Bloom. An open discussion and live Q&A will follow. We'll conclude with announcements. Please note, today's event is for educational purposes only and should not be construed as investment advice nor endorsement. Now I'll hand it over to Sheila to introduce our guests. Thanks, Alex. I'm Sheila Priva, MS in Computer Science from Stanford and a co-president of Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs United. Thanks to everyone for joining today. We look forward to your participation on a topic that has taken center stage over the past year for many of us. We'll share the latest research from Stanford professor Nick Bloom and his colleague Jose Barrero, PhD 2018. Moreover, we are delighted to welcome our speakers, Gobi Dasu and Joyce Sangre. Both are trailblazers in the realm of the future of work. Joyce Sangre is the co-founder and CEO of Alaris, a general catalyst and VC-backed global expansion marketplace that connects emerging market technology companies to American sales and business development professionals. She was the first employee and VP of sales for Human Interest, one of the top 100 most valuable Y Combinator companies of all time. In Singapore, she worked for the president of Microsoft Asia Pacific and at Groupon China, a joint venture with Tencent. In Kenya, she worked for the World Bank, as well as in public health in Zimbabwe. She also worked for the Federal Reserve Bank of New York uh, during the global financial crisis and for the U.S. Department of Labor. She was elected to serve on the Harvard Alumni Association Board of Directors. Joyce received her BA from Harvard University, MPA from Princeton, and MBA from Stanford's Graduate School of Business. Excited to have you, Joyce. Thank you, Sheila. Excited to be here. Gobi Dasu is a founder, traveler, HCI, and ICT 4D enthusiast. You'll have to tell us more about that acronym. After completing bachelor's and master's degrees in computer science at Stanford, he started LD Learning Dollars Talent, which is inspired by his travels and related PhD research at Northwestern. LD Talent is a globally distributed network of 300 plus vetted developers incentivized to engage in lifelong learning. His community has engaged over 65 customers, including companies such as Infosys, universities such as Northwestern, Stanford, Yale, as well as startups backed by top venture capitalists. Currently, there is a need to train more engineers to meet the 21st century demand. Gobi has written about incentivizing technical upskilling, developer productivity, transparent ways of working, and the impact of the future of work on economic development. Overall, Gobi hopes to connect with people who are also interested in technology to incentivize diverse collaborations, lifelong learning, productive ways of working, and economic uplift. Welcome, Gobi. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sheila. So start us off. How did you become interested in the future of work? Gobi? I really became interested in the future of work uh, bit inspired by my travels. So I'm trying to go to 100 countries. <laughs> Um, and been to 37, and I, whenever I visit a country, I'll, I'll note how wealthy it is, um, what's its GDP per capita, things like that. And I just noticed that wherever I go, there's brilliant people everywhere. And it's almost like uh, you take the same brain and you move that brain from who knows where in the world to the Silicon Valley, and all of a sudden that same brain is worth so much more, 10 times more. <laughs> and I found that a little bit ridiculous, and my travels you know, away from the Silicon Valley sort of inspired that thought in me. And um, something I resonated with um, what you said is that, yeah, there's a lot going on in the Silicon Valley, but like it's important for a lot of uh, Stanford alums to also travel to other parts of the world and, and other parts of the country and see what's going on. And so that's sort of what interested me because these themes of remote work, distributed teams, they really uh, have a economic mission, a social mission. Um, and that sort of relates to the acronym ICT for D. Um, which is like information and communication technology for um, development. 
Um, and so, so whenever we think about uh, hiring diverse workforces from different parts of the world, it's it's not just it's going to make um, it's not just going to make uh, your team stronger. Uh, it's not just going to make it so that the sun never sets on your on your company, for instance. But also, it, it's important. It's like a socially good thing to do as well. And that's sort of where my inspiration comes from. So for me, uh, a lot of what Gobi says resonates. And additionally, as Sheila knows, because we originally met through the Sanford Midwest Angels, I grew up in Michigan. It's actually where I'm currently based right now. And growing up, it really uh, was very eye-opening to me that uh, there's the rise and fall of a lot of great technology giants. Because when I was younger, the largest companies in the world were General Motors, Ford, and Daimler Chrysler. And they were the Silicon, and Detroit was the Silicon Valley of its time. Um, and there's always a constant inexorable push towards innovation, but sometimes we forget about the human element of what happens when the entire economy shifts and when jobs change locations or when the center of gravity uh, moves west in this case. So I often grew up with this thought of how can I you know, bring development and bring resources back to the Midwest? Um, how can these great talented people who are educated at top universities, but who want to be here with their families still access the same opportunities? And um, on the other side of the equation, when I spent time abroad working in emerging markets, I just saw the tremendous growth and all the capital that was getting concentrated and accrued in um, Asia, in Latin America, in the Middle East, and in Africa. The, the rate of change and that leapfrogging of um, technology was just incredible. But they were often bottlenecked in some of what they could achieve because of geographic barriers, even nationality or visa barriers, things that seemed a bit arbitrary because talent is universal, but oftentimes, again, I just saw opportunity was bound by geographic and local networks and local resources. So I started thinking a lot about this question of the future of work, um, not just about how to hire diverse teams, that's very important, but also how to economically empower um, employers, employees, or people who are collaborating together. And the, this, even this term employee or employer is of course one that is very uh, tricky because the relationship between those who have capital and those who are working on behalf of those who have capital in order to provide a good or service is also changing dramatically. And this was a question that um, was very interesting to me to, to solve and to try to think what is a mutually beneficial way in which a rising tide can lift all boats, in which you can provide something of great value and you're not, again, uh, bound by your geographic location and also great entrepreneurs and companies can reach markets that they otherwise wouldn't have access to by virtue of their birth or other um, more arbitrary factors in their lives. Excellent. Thank you. From the video, why working from home will stick, Professor Nick Bloom puts perspective on the recent jolt from COVID. Quoting him, to give you a sense of how long it would have taken pre-pandemic working from home was roughly doubling every 12 years. So the pandemic has generated about a quarter of centuries growth of work from home in basically two years. Now that's based on 5% work from home before COVID, 60% at the peak of COVID, and about 25% projected to work from home post-COVID. Could you both share your thoughts on the COVID accelerant to remote work? Joyce? Sure. I'll start with that. Um, so there are quite a few studies that, uh, as, as Professor Bloom had pointed out, um, indicated a timeline where many companies, especially those who are uh, technology enabled, would be able to move their workforce towards a hybrid model or a work from home model. And of course, that was accelerated. But if you think about it, um, in some ways, it's a very uh, Amerocentric approach as well, because we've been outsourcing talent for a very long time. And in many other countries, especially in the IT sectors, they've been working from home, um, working as the remote team or the remote uh, back office of a lot of American companies for a while, or even this phenomenon of virtual assistance. So there's been, there has been a lot of hybrid work, but it's more seen as freelancer work or, or the gig economy. And I think even in the US, what we're finding is that um, it's estimated by 2028, more than half of the US population will identify as a freelancer or a 1099 employee and not a W-2, which is pretty astounding. So there's a couple of different um, phenomenon that 
are happening. I think it's becoming more socially acceptable. In the past, people might have thought, oh, to say I'm a freelancer, I don't want my friends to think I'm unemployed. Whereas now with a creator economy, even with you know YouTubers, um, actually the number one job that American youth say that they want to pursue, the majority of American youth, about 30% um, in the survey, is they want to be a vlogger or YouTube influencer. So it's just indicating that there's actually a very large shift in how people perceive of what work means. Work is something that gives you dignity. It gives you money to put food on the table for yourself and your family, but it doesn't have to take the form of a nine to five where you clock in and clock out at a factory or in an office the way that it did for previous generations. So I do think that this has been accelerated and people are thinking more comprehensively um, and they don't, they might not even call it virtual work or remote work in the future because it is just work. Dobie, would you like to add to that? Yeah, so, so first of all, COVID is, COVID is horrible and um, a lot of people have suffered because of, of COVID, uh, because of family members and, and um, being affected by it or themselves. And, and I think we should recognize that it is very difficult for people to transition quickly. Uh, for instance, people's lives may have been shaken. Uh, that being said, it's also a learning moment. So I think I agree with a lot of what Joyce said, which is that there are so many things we, we have learned uh, in terms of being, when, whenever there's a jolt, whenever a huge fraction of the population is just asked to work differently, uh, we learn new things. For example, we learn that uh, people all over the world are, are equal. And uh, you can, um, you know, you, you could be um, a mom of three kids living in the Philippines uh, who cannot physically travel uh, to work every day, but can work from home and do excellent work. And you can be as effective as someone uh, sitting in a skyscraper in New York City, for instance. I think that is something that we have learned. For instance, I have seen concrete examples that I hadn't really seen before of people, for instance, coming to our platform, discovering full stack developers in Uganda or um, uh, blockchain developers in, in um, Kenya. And these are Stardex companies. These are Y Combinator companies that would originally, before the pandemic, not hire full-time people. They might hire fr freelancers here and there from, from, from all over the world, um, but they would want their engineering team not even to be all over the U.S. They would want their engineering team to basically be in, in, the, United, in, in the Silicon Valley. But now what I saw is like initially they still came in and they were like, oh, our platform gives a free trial. They're going to fund hours and work with them as contractors, like similar to other online contracting freelancing platforms. But what we discovered in 2021 was that people were converting the, were taking the contract to hire model a lot more seriously, seriously. So before there would be like two buckets, people who are remote freelancers and people who are like, full-time employees sitting in Palo Alto. And now it's a little bit different. It's like, you can be remote, but that doesn't necessarily mean, as, as Joyce sort of alluded to, that you are, you're not a full-time employee now. So what we saw is a lot of people discovering, oh, these, these developers in Africa are really, really good. Um, we're gonna work with them as contractors for a few months, but eventually if they work well, they're gonna become we're going to like buy out or whatever. They're going to become full-time employees at our company um, at, in our distributed team. So, so a lot of people asking questions more like, how good are you? Like, what can you do? How, how well can you like execute on the work? And a lot less like, where are you based? Um, I think that, that that is something that has, that has come out of this. Now let's talk about the future of the future of work. Let me show you a chart from Professor Bloom. In Why We're Working From Home Will Stick, he shared that the percentage of patent applications and investments in new technologies to facilitate work from home rose dramatically since February of 2020. What areas do you see as ripe for innovation? As we, we were in lockdown and and we were made to do many, many things remotely. 
I and people I've talked to in business have realized how many things that we can possibly do remotely. So it's almost not even the question of like, where, what do we think could be done in a different way in the future of work, but almost like what couldn't be done differently? Um, for instance, like just like affordances of like video chat, for instance, affordances of video chat are, are areas that are ripe for, for innovation. The way we do meetings, um, things like like detecting when, when, you're, when you're engaging in conversation with video chat, for some venues, like when you're talking to friends, maybe it's a little bit different. But for instance, in business venues, in, in sales calls, you might want to know, is the other side, am I losing the attention of the other side? Um, there are areas where you could use a little bit of computer vision and um, natural language processing to sort of figure out when you're on a sales call, when am I losing the other party? What can I do? What kind of language can I do to improve my performance? So that's like a concrete example of an area where you might see a lot of companies um, sort of build technologies. Um, in terms of telemedicine, if you're a doctor and you wanna like see different aspects of a patient, um, right? There are certain things that you could do. You could have a app, like a sort of like sensors on the individual or different things where you could look into their ear, for instance, uh, without actually stepping in and using devices. You could even have um, devices shipped to individual, if they're affordable enough, uh, medical devices shipped to individual people um, and and um, they could use it in their, at the convenience of their home. Uh, and, and you as a doctor could maybe read the data from those devices. So those are some concrete examples. And especially with the, in the rise of like infectious diseases and things like that, it almost is even a health concern for people to meet their own doctor on occasion. And so, so there are a lot of benefits in, in um, you know, one doctor I talked to, for instance, said that, uh, when you talk to a patient and they're in the comfort of their own home, you can sort of see their environment and their environment actually matters a lot as well, uh, which is not there if they're coming into the doctor's office. Those are really great examples. Um, and we're seeing that as well because we work with companies from all over that are trying to scale their startups. And they really believe in this model of built in India or built in Israel and made for the world. And um, telemedicine has seen a boost, also e-commerce, uh, also fintech and financial services. But one that's very near and dear to my heart, which I saw Valerie mention in the chat room um, indirectly on Julia and Chris and others who I, I know are leaders in the Stanford community care about this topic is the rise of DEI. Um, how diversity, equity and inclusion initiatives have actually become accelerated because of COVID. And there was already pr previously this whole notion of, okay, well, we should have blind resumes, but ultimately, even with a blind resume, you will meet the person in person and their physical appearance, you know, how old they are, how tall they are, all these things do factor in. Um, and now what we're seeing is people are focusing more on deliverables. What can you accomplish? What can you do? And that actually does help even the playing field a lot more. You're not being judged as much, I suppose, uh, um, it's, it's still difficult. I think we're still evolving as a society, but you're not being judged as much by things that are outside of your control, but more um, by things that you can deliver because work has become much more quantifiable and also has become much more structured. Because if you're working with someone who's remote and you have to be, as a manager, flex new muscles, you have to be very clear about what you want. You have to be very clear about even asynchronous communications because of time zones, um, because of other things. And so I, I actually think this is really pushing forward better DEI um, in, the, in this whole global economy. That's an excellent point. Uh, so Joyce, you recently fundraised from General Catalyst and other prominent venture funds. What are investors looking for in companies in this space? Yeah, thanks, Sheila. That's a great question. Well, investors are always looking for, I guess, exciting ideas, a big market, which this clearly is, and um, huge growth. So they oftentimes will look at um, growth, but also they want to make sure it's sort of not just a tailwind from COVID, but one that is going to continue even beyond. And given that a lot of indications are the future of work is sort of a new normal that's here to stay, then 
It's about, you know, how, um, how wide the adoption is and how interoperable it is with different systems. And so a lot of investors are very keen on this. There have been a couple of funds that have started that are specifically geared towards future of work just because it's such a hot topic area. Thanks. Now we have a short survey from Professor Bloom and Jose Barrero. Okay, thanks everyone. Joyce, Scoby, what are your thoughts on the results? Let me share those. Wow, that's, um, well, I suppose it's also because it's the Stanford Angels and everyone tends to be um, on the cutting edge of, of things or for many companies, it, it shouldn't be too surprising, but this is a smaller percent of fully on-site um, than I think is the average in the U.S. at least. Yeah, I have to agree with that. I think it also um, varies by whether somebody's, what, whether you're talking about industry or academia and different types of industry as well. For instance, if you're looking at, a say, a university, sometimes the in-person experience is what they're selling to differentiate themselves from, say, an online course. Whereas if you're looking at a, at a, at a company that makes money for building software, um, it's a very different thing. Or um, for instance, if you're looking at McKinsey or any, any sort of consulting firm, um, maybe part of their value is just by the human connection. I don't know. Um, but, but I think that this, the survey seems to be, um, well, I agree with you in that it seems to be higher levels of hybrid and remote work from what we've seen the averages are. What I would also be really interested in is um, it, the, the pros and cons and what people are losing or gaining. And this is something that's very personal to teams, to um, hiring managers, to the employees in question, as well as to the companies. But um, something that I think about a lot, not just for the companies we work with, but also of course, internally as a founder um, is, you know, how can we create a really strong team culture in which everyone really feels invested in each other and in the success of the organization and how much of that can still be done virtually and how and what are you losing when you don't have that in-person um, that in-person kind of work environment and so the strategy we've come up with which I think is just maybe a function of the fact that we're a startup and we're a bit smaller and everyone is open to this um, is that we're fully virtual but we we give everyone you know stipends for um, specifically for you know, we'll, we'll send them Uber Eats like desserts or we'll give them kind of um, team meal like reimbursements so that if they're in town with someone else or if they want to meet up, they can. Um, and we're planning to do uh, quarterly sort of get togethers of the whole team once of course it's safe to travel because some of our team is not located in the US and they can't actually enter. So it wouldn't be very fair to have a team get together and exclude them. Um, so those are some things that we've devised around uh, culture and maintaining that element so that everyone still gets excited and they look forward to it because first they actually start becoming colleagues and building relationships virtually. So when they meet in person, it already feels like a natural continuation. Um, but it's, you know, just very different because usually in the past you're used to meeting someone in person and then maybe adding them on social media and kind of texting them and having this virtual relationship. But now the paradigm is totally shifted and it's something that uh, is exciting because we're on the cutting edge of it. But it is challenging as a manager and as someone who has to think about these things and, and kind of preserve and maybe even strengthen the culture. Yeah, I, I think that that's very interesting. And I think that one thing that's, that's really, really, uh, that I noticed uh, was LinkedIn. They, uh, and they always used to have this uh, thing that said, if you're adding someone, when, when you add someone as a connection on LinkedIn, they said, have you met this person before? But they changed that now. They changed that from, have you met this person physically before to, have you met this person either physically or online before? So I think there's also a recognition that people are developing full on relationships with other people, business relationships, friendships, et cetera, um, purely online. And so, so that's one thing. It's like almost like, Yes, there are things lost. There are also things gained as, as well because you get to build relationships with people who might, you might not necessarily have been able to before just because of location constraints. I think some of the concrete ways that we as an organization have cr created culture 
Um, I mean, I, I have heard of a lot of companies, like you mentioned, that do retreats like yours. And then also there's, they, there's companies like Buffer, Zapier, um, that have HubSpot. A lot of them, um, I think more Buffer and Zapier uh, and Automatic, which is the company that makes WordPress. They do have cultures of remote work. And then, uh, you know, you, you have a retreat once a few months or maybe once a year where everyone gets an in-person. I think that is one strategy. Um, maybe another strategy for teams that may not have the budget for that or, or teams that, that may not logistically be able to do that is, is maybe it's okay to accept that, that uh, you are giving up certain things by working remotely in a remote distributed team where you don't necessarily meet in person, uh, but build other affordances of, of things like, for instance, um, the, uh, things that you could only do if you were remote. For instance, uh, hiring really diverse teams. That is one example of something that you, you probably can't do if you constrain to a particular location, um, just by virtue of the fact that not everyone in the world can move around. So you're, by constraining to a particular location, you're, you're definitely going to um, exclude people, um, or by constraining to um, to, to a particular ability to travel, you're, you're excluding people. So those are trade-offs. It's almost like choosing what type of culture, what type of company you, you, you wanna be. Another thing is uh, try to think about the ways you do things like in person, you talk about different life interests, books, music, et cetera. You talk about, um, you, you, know, you meet up with people, you opportunistically see people in a hallway and things like that. And there are different softwares that are co cropping up like gather.town and, and donut, which is a Slack add-on that randomly matches people and, and different softwares like that. Um, I would try to like experiment with some of those uh, because while they may not create the exact same level of opportunistic um, conversation as um, things that are in person, they may also create abilities to talk with people who you may not have necessarily talked to. Um, yeah, and exactly on that point, uh, Gobi, uh, Joyce, I don't think we would have met if the whole virtual world didn't gain prominence. Yeah, that, that's basically the point. <laughs> I mean, feel so, like it's so masterful at creating online uh, communities through Zoom and really being able to extend the reach. So I wanted to commend Sheila for all she's done and I, I, I agree. I feel very lucky that, um, that we were able to meet through these forums. Yeah, you've done such a fantastic job organizing this and you're so methodical about it. And I've, I've learned so much from you. Uh, Thanks so much, both of you. So now I'd like to share a headline from yesterday's Wall Street Journal. Work from anywhere perks give Silicon Valley a new edge in talent war. Startups in smaller markets feel pinch as coastal tech giants poach their employees. A national competition for every hire. Uh, Joyce and Gobi, what are your thoughts there? Is that what you're hearing from hiring managers? I th well, in general, I think hiring managers will always say that there's not enough talent um, to go around at any point, not just during a pandemic, but any any time you talk to hiring managers, this is a this is a, a constant refrain, even at the largest, most well funded uh, companies. And on the flip side, from you know people, they oftentimes say it's hard to find a really great opportunity. So there's a lot of inefficiency in the market when it comes to talent and placements and uh, and um, you know recruiting in general. So this recent phenomenon, in my opinion at least, it's um, one in which it actually does extend the reach of companies and sort of makes everyone feel a little bit more that they have to step up to the plate. It's always it always feels a little scary when, you know, Google is interviewing the same people you are, but on the other levels, it really means that everyone can sort of up level and have access to more opportunities and those local economies, it, they benefit because, you know, they're earning um, someone, let's say based in Milwaukee or based in Tulsa is earning salaries that uh, at a level they otherwise wouldn't have, or even beyond that in Lahore or in Berlin. Um, and they're distributing that money locally because they're consuming, they're part of the community. So I actually think this is beneficial. You're, you are spreading out the wealth quite literally. 
Um, and yes, I, I do understand that hiring managers will oftentimes feel a bit frustrated that there's more competition for the talent, but that that means the other talents in their in their community that they would otherwise hire, then they can give someone else a chance and to hire for potential. I think this is another big shift that we're seeing, that it's more and more important than ever before not to hire for experience necessarily, that someone's already been there, done that, but to hire and, and really invest in training and upskilling people because it's incredibly important. Human capital is the most valuable resource any company can have, um, and even more so when you live in this future of work space. Uh, and so it's, you know, you have to compete, you have to really show what, what it is that you can do, how you can help develop them, how you can help propel their career to the next level, the mentorship you offer, the um, friendships and community that you have. And I, I think this is just better for everyone to be held to a higher standard. Excellent. Now it's time for the live Q&A and open discussion. I know that Christina had asked a question pretty early on, uh, or like earlier on in the conversation. Mm -hmm. Does is Christina still on the line? Does she want to ask her question? Hi, I'm just navigating the unmute button. <laughs> Sorry. Um, there we go. All right. Um, yeah. So I'm a small business um, owner, and um, when the pandemic started, um, we actually went to work from home earlier than most others. And people flew to the winds. They, 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 you know, went and to live with family. I have a pretty young staff. Um, some of them followed significant others to other states. And so now we, we have a situation where we have seven um, different states <laughs> where people are, are actually residing, um, you know, with 10 employees with a total of 15, 15 total employees. So, um, you know, just the regulatory burden of that and, and, and Folks do want to just continue into perpetuity working from home. So, but what we're finding is that, you know, while now we're paying, you know, tax withholding in all these seven states, if we actually do, you know, solidify and working from home, give up our office space, now we're going to have to be paying unemployment insurance in all seven states and also income taxes in all seven states and all of the headaches that that. So just the regulatory burden of distributing our workforce is is pretty huge, un unless you know you guys have a different idea. Um, that's that's my biggest concern actually right now. That and then the training question that someone else brought up. But sure, sure. Well, uh, Sheila had previously asked about what innovation um, our investor is investing in. And so actually HR tech has been a really big area of an investment. And um, I, I'm curious, Christina, what do you use for your HRIS or for um, payroll and benefits management, et cetera? Um, we use Intuit for payroll and Bamboo for um, HR, yeah. Okay, well, actually, I was going to make the suggestion that Gregory said. So Gusto, which actually was co-founded by a GSB alum, um, has payroll and compliance in all 50 states. And it's really, their growth has really been accelerated by COVID. But you should also look at, I would be remiss not to tell you to look at some of their competitors just so you can make the decision that's best for your business. So there's Rippling, which um, is similar. There are also PEO services like JustWorks um, is one that's quite that's also venture backed and has grown very significantly. Those are probably the right ones for um, you know small medium businesses. There are others for larger businesses, but I think for your um, state size size of company, Gusto, Rippling, or JustWorks would be really great options to look into. So they would take care of the unemployment insurance payments and the income tax filings and the withholdings necessary for for the different states. So we, you don't have yeah, to. Yeah, I mean we we do do that now, um, but. If, if we give up, an, uh, the, the, I, this is what my tax accountant told me, if we give up our office and have everybody working from home, then all of a sudden we no longer have a place of business in, you know, our, in our main office. And so we have to pay unemployment insurance in all the seven states. And what that does is then the seven states say, oh, you have workers in our state. You have to pay company taxes in all seven states. And so as a very small business, you know, that's just a very big regulatory burden. I mean, we have a payroll provider who, who, who does our payroll, but this is a sort of another level up and we're grappling with that right now. 
That's an interesting problem, yeah. Um, so in this case, and I don't want to, as the disclaimer in the beginning was, this is not investment advice, so I should also add sure. this is not legal or accounting advice by yeah. any means. Um, but, you know, there. this is actually a really great question you bring up, Christina, because I think uh, I, I obviously um, used to work in public policy, so there are so many questions around, um, you know, what is these definitions of what is the place of doing business. So in many ways, it, it's where you're incorporated, but everyone's incorporated in Delaware. Not everyone, but many people. And of course, not every company in the U.S. is. So then it's also you have the foreign registration of the state in which the, um, I forget exactly now the legal term, but it's like the preponderance of your team or the majority of your team is domiciled or located. Um, so, uh, so you as the owner or, um, of the company, where you're located um, on, on some levels by, de by default would be uh, would kind of fit under some of those definitions or where like if there's even one other employee in there, um, that could potentially also be something that you look at. So there's uh, oftentimes the IRS, especially as so much is changing, and there is also, of course, been a lot of, um, you know, tax credits granted to promote small business ownership and the Small Business Administration, SBA, has given out so many grants during COVID. I I don't think that their goal is to make this onerous um, and their intention was cer certainly not to penalize people like you who are providing jobs and who are creating employment opportunities, um, but of course, rather to just offer protection for workers. Um, so I, I think, again, you should talk to your accountant and just make sure you're comfortable, sure you're comfortable with it or find an employment lawyer, but um, you would still, by many definitions, probably be able to say that based on where you are domiciled, that's still the headquarters of your company. But again, I don't Want you to quote yeah, me I don't that. want to yeah. dominate the conversation, but just a little note: it's not the IRS; it's the states that mm -hmm. want revenue, <laughs> right? They they want a, a portion of our of our company's revenues, so they're being mm -hmm. very aggressive. I mean, you probably know California is extremely aggressive. They look at, mm -hmm. you know, even individual um, taxpayers where they where they spend money on their credit card statements to establish whether they live in California or not. And so if you're basically telling California that you have employees in California, they want part of the company's mm -hmm. income tax. So anyway, I, I don't want to dominate the conversation. It's just that there's, it's, it's a nice utopia. And we decided we would tell our employees, you can live wherever you want. And then we're hitting sort of these, these realities that are very difficult for a I small a question. Um, you said that the majority of your workforce is fairly young, right? Um, yeah. Is the main reason why they want to be treated as employees rather than as contractors, for instance, for health insurance? What 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 do they get out of being employees rather than um, um, contractors? Well, we actually do have some contractors. Um, yeah, we've we've traditionally been employees. It's important to me to offer health insurance. Um, so it's also cheaper to have them as employees, but yeah. Maybe not now. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're, that, that's a good question. I'll have to noodle on that. Yeah, if you could pay them more, like, because you don't, I, I didn't know that it was actually cheaper to have them as employees. I thought it would be more expensive because like, if you, because if they're fairly young, their health insurance, if they buy it out of pocket might not be that expensive. So then if you just, if now it's not any more, more expensive to have them as contractors maybe if you just like say hey if you're not going to be in the same state as where we're incorporated then um we can pay you extra to buy your own health insurance and yeah. we'll treat you as a contractor yeah no i'll i'll, I'll think mm -hmm. about that um we have some confidentiality issues and and we're it's a consulting company so i just have to sort of navigate that other part of it as well. But thank you for your thoughts. I, I, I'm sorry to dominate so much of the conversation here. I wanted to, to mention in terms of like the ways, the paradigms of what work is. So like there's this article online, if you Google the five levels of remote work, um, there's like, like trying to replicate the exact same nine to five schedule online in an online version with a lot of meetings on Zoom and such. But there's also like a lot of paradigms about like what can be better done asynchronously um, versus what can be done synchronously. What do you need people to be in the time zone, same time zone for versus 
what could actually be better done with time zone diversity? For instance, customer support that's 24 seven. It's a lot easier to do customer support that's 24 seven if you have people um, all over the world. Sometimes when you're dealing with a lot of problems um, that require a lot of thinking, sometimes it's actually better rather than trying to figure out something on, in a meeting together to let each person get, take their time to think and respond asynchronously. So Paul says, things have changed mightily since Marissa Meyer summoned everyone back from telecommuting in 2013. Her rationale was fostering innovation and creativity, presumably from conversations around the water cooler. Assuming that her move was not baseless or mistaken, how will fully remote work foster the innovation and creativity Ms. Meyer sought? Yeah. Well, um, I think Obi mentioned a, a little bit some of this rise of um, being very thoughtful about asynchronous work versus synchronous work. So in addition to that, and it's kind of blending in um, one of the questions that Valerie asked earlier about how can you onboard people? I do think that, um, you know, there are lots of companies like Notion is one or many other um, uh, startups that are really around kind of codifying and passing on knowledge and having either an internal knowledge base or internal wiki or some, some matter of being able to preserve everything that, you know, perhaps if you're in a team meeting and everyone's speaking more frequently, they would just take that as a matter of course. So it's actually better for continuity planning and also for succession planning because so much more is captured and written down rather than just, um, kind of assumed or, or spoken uh, or passed along orally. So there are ways in which, um, and when you talked about the water cooler conversation, some of these are, are, perhaps it feels more structured, but it definitely leads to better um, training and then better innovation. So in terms of creativity, the people often talk about what is that serendipity of Silicon Valley? Why is it that when you have a gathering of some of the best and brightest minds, you can accomplish such incredible things. And part of it is because there weren't options to have a convening of the minds other than in person before. And we've become accustomed to that notion. But if we are very thoughtful, um, we there are many ways in which people have kind of uh, virtual sort of hackathons where everyone's co-working at the same time. Um, there are companies like Tandem and others that uh, will facilitate some sort of collaboration where it simulates being in person. Um, there's also just carving out, uh, you know, again, work meetings and having things in the agenda that are actually not meant to be structured, but are meant to just be like a virtual water cooler or virtual um, free flow of information and time. Like even, I suppose, this Q&A session right now, this is not, uh, these were not questions that we anticipated beforehand. This is more a dialogue, a conversation that we're having. So this is one, one way in which I think if everyone is actively trying to be engaged. I think it much more is an opt-in um, mindset, but if everyone's more engaged and wants to be collaborative and innovative, you can still have a lot of that. Um, I had a thought on that um, as well. I, I, I really like what you just said. Um, and I wanted to provide a few examples of some of those creative ways. For instance, how does innovation happen? Well, well, it actually is happening right now, even to like adjust to the remote work setting. Um, for instance, a lot of people were concerned about whether employees are doing good work or not. Um, and one thing that we sort of came up with, we saw like different ways of time tracking, like Upwork had their time tracker where they like clock hours and um, you have different methods of logging. But one of the things that we thought about was like, if everyone's just talking in Slack, what if we make the Slack messages themselves be the way you bill your and get paid. Like I've concretely finished this task or I'm concretely working on this task. Um, that's a message I'm writing in Slack. And then people never have to ask me, what am I working on? Because I'm like, sort of like saying 30 minutes working on this 30 minutes. Here's a like link to what I've built. Um, and then sort of have the customer be able to, or the uh, manager be able to sort of like approve those work sessions. That is one sort of like technique that has sort of worked with us. And that's been sort of the secret sauce of, of our company um, getting a lot of traction. Um, another thing, another like example of sort of an innovation that we've had and sort of relates to Joyce's point about lifelong learning was like, yeah, if you don't have certain things in an in online work setting, what could you do differently? Like one of the things we do is like, if developers in our network are not, um, 
like working with clients at a given time, we'll actually pay them money to go out, learn new things and post about it on our blog. So we've had that happen over a hundred times and people write these really rich accounts of their learning um, and examples of, for instance, code that they've written. And, and then another developer, here's the social aspect, peer reviews that, that, um, that lifelong learning project. Um, and so, yes, you do lose certain things, but there are also like clever um, ways that you can uh, facilitate collaboration between, especially the key here is people who are better fit for each other who wouldn't have otherwise met in person. Um, so that, that's, those are some examples. Thanks, Gobi. Uh, Han would like to ask a question now. Han? Hi, uh, yeah. So yes, uh, everybody loves to work from home. Like almost like all the people are vaccinated, but when, when do the survey, yes, 80% are vaccinated, but uh, only 20% uh, wants to go back to the office. And it'll, it'll work fine in say, in say, uh, uh, technology company in the Silicon Valley when people are incentive, incentivized by like, you know, their uh, contribution. But uh, let's say in a big organization where uh, like, you know, say firing or uh, evaluation is somewhat, uh, not that flexible or uh, structure wise, it's such a big organization that uh, like no one, like, you know, it's very difficult to attribute uh, who's doing well versus who's not doing very well. And then uh, is it potentially like a concern that overall the whole uh, employees uh, together gets basically slacking out, uh, chilling out uh, and um, it's just like, you know, not uh, performing as, uh, as needed, uh, especially if they're in there's no like little incentive for that rather they they are getting paid no matter what then it's like uh just like you know uh yeah i mean i i yeah i'm sure that a lot of uh companies uh like may like you know may not need creativity all the time uh, it could it could work uh like you know regular basis but then may end up having to hire like five people instead of like two people. That's a great question, Han. I, I think um, for some organizations, part of it is about um, trust and also fostering a work culture in which people aren't, um, you know, trying to are, are trying to be contributors to the team. They're trying to do what's best for the team and not necessarily. And it also means that the employer has to trust that whatever personal circumstances lead them to work perhaps different hours, um, it's possible to do so. I mean, as I could hear in the background, it sounds like you probably have a family. Um, I have a baby at home, as Sheila knows, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to work virtually because I have so many friends who after basically um, one or two months of leave had to go back and then they had this horrible experience of, um, you know, just burning, basically burnout is real as Valerie was saying of, of like not getting enough sleep at night and also of having to run into the bathroom to pump because there's of course no uh, room for that in, in a lot of older organizations and so on and so forth. It was just a, a bit of an ordeal and now um, people can go offline during certain hours and then be back online in the evenings to continue with work in a way that perhaps wouldn't have been possible in an in-office environment. Uh, but as you point out, sometimes it is true that some people are just not a good fit for an organization and they need that accountability of having um, a manager be able to see their computer screen to see what they're working on. But there's there are other types of work let, uh, where let's say it's more about the software you deploy and it doesn't necessarily have to be between the hours of nine to five because actually some engineers are much more productive later at night rather than early in the morning. They don't prefer to work early morning or even for salespeople or uh, you know realtors. They don't necessarily, the hours worked is somewhat correlated with the output but also some people are just very efficient or they're very lucky and their compensation is tied to performance in a way that's not necessarily tied as much to the being in an office from nine to five. So I guess there, there are just more 
creative ways, I think, in which um, employers and employees will have to figure out how best to work together. Yeah, I just think uh, for some organizations where, uh, let's say, uh, there's no uh, like direct relationship between your performance versus, say, promotion or a raise, it, uh, it can easily, easily be, uh, employees can easily be just lose motivation and just collect paycheck day by day, mm -hmm. uh, slacking out. It just, I mean, yeah, it's just, uh, I think, uh, like corporate structure issue. Yeah, Han, I think maybe I could, maybe I could give you an idea. And this is not something, this is sort of related to what I was sharing before, but maybe you can come up with something. Like it's all about communication at the end of the day. So we came up with this and that you're billing, if you're not billing for your, if you're not like working hard for your raise, right? Or you're not working hard for certain incentives that are available in Silicon Valley, for instance, that you mentioned, what are you working hard for? Well, sometimes it could be that your communication is the reward. So you could align like reward, really transparent, high quality communication. Um, that's one way. And these are all just trust building mechanisms. So if they don't work or, or if they're no longer needed after a while, you don't need them anymore. But like, here's, here's an example of like, she describes what she's working on in transparent detail, maybe including links. And then maybe you could come up with something like that um, for the short term as you build trust and align incentives for high, better communication. Yeah, but at the same time, I don't want to like log in, uh, like basically broadcasting what I've been, what I'm doing every 30 minutes as well, right? You can make it a daily update, but yeah. like, like just like some sort of like, it doesn't have to be that. It could just be something that measures good communication. Uh, one of the thoughts that I had too, um, from what Gobi was saying is communication is one of the things that we've seen across different geographies and within uh, um, the US as well that has become even more important during the, co the future of work. And when we think about what skills are very important to have um, effective communication, either verbal, written, or even you know body language over Zoom being more expressive, like having having your uh, um, in this case, I mean, of course, everyone's listening, so we don't mind. But like cameras on and being really engaged and leaning forward, there's so much that can be communicated, and so people really rely upon those cues and similar ways in which networking happens or managing up and letting uh, you know your boss or your team know what you've been doing. Not necessarily like a day by day, like logging a timesheet per se, but just being very communicative and kind of advocating for yourself. I think that's become even more important, but it's already important in work. It's not always the um, person who logs the most hours who gets promoted, but rather the one who um, earns the trust of their team or their manager, or um, somehow has performed in a way that might be more about interpersonal dynamics. And, and I think that um, that, is actually even more at the forefront now um, as people move virtually. Well, thanks very much. Um, we're about up to time. Final question for the speakers today. What's your parting advice to the audience? Joyce? Sure. I think change is um, oftentimes scary. And of course, there's been, uh, there have been many tragedies that led to this change, but it's also an exciting opportunity. So I, I encourage everyone to continue to just adopt um, a lifelong learning mindset that there are ways in which this could be a great opportunity for your career and especially a great equalizer when it comes to giving employers the opportunity to hire diverse teams across the world at a price point that they can afford and also to promote more diversity and equity. And, of course, and I think that um, people's habits, both from the way that managers have to manage their teams, as well as governments reacting to incentivizing the right behavior will adapt. But um, we're really living at the cutting edge. So it's exciting. And I wish everyone the best of luck with it. Wonderfully said. Uh, very simply, treat this as an opportunity, uh, as as sort of J Joyce was saying, this is an opportunity to ask yourself, who would I want to meet? Who would I want to learn from? Who would I want to work with that I wouldn't be able to do if I wasn't given this opportunity of, of working with people remotely? Um, and now it's your chance to seize that opportunity. You can work with that person halfway across the world. You can work with that person who's not able to commute to work. You can work with them, you can learn from them. So 
So treat it as an opportunity and, and seek out that person that you wouldn't have otherwise met. Excellent advice from both of you on treating change as opportunity. Thanks very much, Gobi and Joyce, for joining our community today. We appreciate your knowledge on the future of work. I'll hand it back to Alex for announcements. Thank you, Shiva. And uh, thank you so much, <clears throat> Gobi and Joyce, again, for the wonderful discussion and all the insights you've shared with us. Thank you, Sheila, for moderating, and thank you to uh, the audience for your participation. We have a few announcements to make before we conclude, conclude today's event. Uh, first, upcoming regular programming. So our next virtual event, Pitch Perfect, a real-time pitch diagnosis, will take place August 25th, the last Wednesday of the month. As part of our legal series, join us for Intellectual Property and Startups on September 29th with leading attorneys Ruben Chen, JD03, Candice Su, BS07, MS08, and Greg Meyer, Mayor, MS88. Second, we welcome your suggestions for programming such as today's event. Please send a note with your suggestions or, desire, or a desire to help in the email. Leave the session open for a few minutes for those who would like to note this information. This concludes today's session. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a great rest of your week.